Thank you all for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Dobrý den, dámy a pánové. Vítáme vás. We're actually waiting for our third panelist to join us, but my strong suspicion is he will be here shortly. So I think we'll start and under the presumption that Miklos Harasti will be here in just a moment. I'm Chris Walker. I'm executive director of the International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy. It's really a pleasure to be here in Prague. Pleasure to have a panel on this subject with such wonderful panelists. Um, I'm going to say just a few words at the outset to uh, summarize the issue. I'll then ask each of the panelists to say a few words um, relevant to their country or other observations they have on the subject. It's a fairly intimate space here, so I think we'll keep it as um, casual as we can. Uh, we'll have a discussion on the panel briefly, and then we'll open it up to questions from all of you. I was struck in the earlier session today, for those of you who were there and saw the discussion on uh, changing media, of this idea that today we're in this unprecedented time of uh, information uh, diffusion, accessibility to inter information through the internet, which suggests that, um, at least at some level, Everything we need is now available and um, we should be in pretty good shape when it comes to uh, information and politics and the way we operate in a civic context. Uh, I would argue that it's not necessarily so clear and so rosy at the minute for a variety of reasons. If we talk about countries that are politically repressive, where the space is closed, I think what we're finding is that while there's now enormous diversity of information, uh, the quality of that information as it relates to politics and political life and policy um, is not where it should be today. And this is one of the paradoxes we find. This is what we find, I think, in the context of today's session, which is titled The Persistent Influence of State-Dominated Media. So we have this paradox where in a whole range of countries that you would find in the, say, not free category of Freedom House assessments have um, far more information diversity than a gener generation ago in terms of entertainment, in terms of personal communication, in terms of access to information that would have been unthinkable a generation ago. Um, but when it comes to politics, when it comes to discussions of meaningful issues, uh, this is a very different question. I'll give an example just to start off to put this in perspective. Uh, within the last week, there was a very well, um, see we're joined by Miklos Sharazdi. No worries, it's good to have you. Thank you so much. Better late, all right. Uh, in Venezuela, there was an election recently in which the incumbent uh, president, Hugo Chavez, uh, won the election. And in a good deal of mass media reporting, the election was depicted as not a perfect election, but nonetheless um, one that the president won in an atmosphere of relative uh, freedom. Um, I think some of the data I'll share with you may raise some questions about this, directly relevant to this issue of uh, state media, and I'll explain um, where this information uh, comes from after I share it with you. In the 90-day period leading up to Election Day in Venezuela, this was the uh, stated time frame for uh, election uh, discussion in that country, the advantage that the incumbent enjoyed was about 25 to 1 compared to the competitor, Mr. Capriles, in uh, Venezuela. So over that 90-day period, the amount of government resource that was invested into private TV outlets was roughly $200 million, uh, $250 million for President Chavez. Uh, during that time, the opposition candidate was strictly limited to only three minutes a day of airtime on privately owned stations. Um, he had about 4% of the overall airtime that Chavez had in that respect. To put in perspective the infrastructure of the mass media in the country, right now about 430 of 830 radio stations and six of the eight national TV stations are either owned or controlled by the authorities. So it's really a rather um, devastating uh, advantage in that context. This came from um, uh, one of the board members of Transparency Venezuela, which is the affiliate of 
uh, Transparency International. This is Mr. Aurelio Conchesa, who made a presentation at an event the NED held last week in Lima, Peru, where he described this in much more detail. I think it speaks to the shield and sword nature, if you can describe it that way, of state media. What you find is in this dominant uh, sphere where the authorities are able to use state media to tarnish political opposition at the same time they deny a meaningful discussion of politically relevant issues, corruption, public policy, it makes for a very profound disadvantage and it's important to keep in mind and I think this is the, this is the key point. I think we've become um, distracted in some ways by the uh, fantastic potential and growth of new media such that we don't look at the reality that in a country like Venezuela or Russia for example, Russia today 75 percent of the public gets its news and information from television. 75 percent still gets its news and information from television. This is despite the fact you have very rapidly growing access to the internet in Russia, something on the order of 50 million of 140 million uh, in the country today. So I think it's very important to make the distinction between, on the one hand, diversity of media and media information, which enables a wide range of um, things ranging from sports to entertainment to social discussion, and things that are what we might define as politically and civically relevant which I would argue from a perspective of media and democracy, which is the title of this conference, is the most important thing. And to keep this in mind in the discussion, of course, this has relevance to the democracies as well, where the economics of media and some of the pressures that are emerging uh, across the media landscape, whether we're talking about established democracies, middle performing democracies, it's very true. But I think this question of the degree to which there's meaningful information available in authoritarian settings, which is the topic of this discussion, raises some real questions. So just a couple of other observations before I introduce our panelists. One of the ways in which regimes like those in China, Russia, Venezuela, Iran maintain power is by maintaining a dominant hand on mass media, usually through television, and then implementing a, a degree of um, several layers of strategies that are very, very damaging for democratic development. I'll just mention a couple of them. One is, as part of the sword um, dimension of state media and the sealed and, uh, shield and sword analogy, civil society is one of the principal targets of state media campaigns. So if you look at, for example, uh, Egypt, both in the lead up to the ouster of Hosni Mubarak, but even in the months after his um, removal from the political scene, state media was still tarnishing civil society and activists with a very harsh brush, in essence trying to undermine them. If you look at state media in Russia today, in Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Belarus, uh, state media is used relentlessly to tarnish political opposition, civil society. You only need to open the newspapers um, here in the last few days to see what's going on in Russia. Part of this um, strategy is to use both the law and regulations, but the law and regulations that are used to say prohibit um, meaningful civil, civil society activity is done in the context of this very consistent messaging and narratives that activists and democracy uh, supporters are somehow working against state sovereignty, and this is one of the messages, that are working somehow for outside forces, that are somehow not working with values that are consistent with those of the country. When this is done on a daily basis, in prime time context, on state television, which remains the dominant media force, it has a profound impact. So I would suggest that while we continue to recognize the uh, undeniable value of new media and the promise it holds that we take um, a fresh-eyed look at the ongoing role that uh, traditional media is playing because it may be that uh, five or seven or ten years from now we'll all reconvene here and I hope we do and revisit this subject and we'll, we'll find that uh, the dominant television control in these settings has eased and that the discussion of politics and policy will have opened up in a way that we would all agree has been healthy and good for uh, people living inside these countries. But I think until that time arises and until we see the model that will allow new media to provide editorial scrutiny 
and meaningful um, translation of difficult issues to the public that consumes it, which I think is still a work in progress, I think we need to take a very close look at the media that continues to provide most of news and information to the citizens in these countries. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists we have here today. It's a terrific uh, group of experts with wonderful um, country diversity, and we can talk a little bit more about um, some of the issues arising in some of the countries specifically. But what I'd like to do is introduce the panelists. They can then speak in the order I introduce them. I'll keep it very brief because you have their bios, and they can, of course, elaborate and uh, discuss. Um, well, I will be magnanimous, and I'll start with you uh, nevertheless. Uh, Miklos Harasti is a friend, and um, many of you may know him from a variety of hats he's wear, which includes having been um, the OSCE uh, special representative on the media, which took him to um, a number of uh, media-challenged environments, I guess we could say, uh, to make sure that a bright light was shined and the right sort of attention was directed to these countries. He also has a long um, and distinguished career as a journalist and as a writer and was, in fact, uh, one of the leading dissidents in Hungary leading up to uh, the changes that came to that country in 1989. To my immediate left is Yuri Andrukovic, and it's my pleasure to have him here from uh, Kiev. He's a writer and poet who has, as you'll see in his bio, a very extensive list of publications uh, that are well known to many of you. And then to his left is uh, Hu Yang from uh, China, who's here with us today, who's a professor at Peking University, and he's a recognized media critic and uh, observer of the media there, and very much look forward to his comments. So what I might do is ask each of the panelists to speak for uh, about five to seven minutes, share their observations. We'll then have a conversation here and open it up to uh, all of you for a discussion at that point. Miklos. Thank you so much, Christopher. Um, um, I'm talking, talking about still existing state media. Uh, I would um, mention, touch for a moment only, the absurdity of still having state-owned print media in some countries. You instinctively know something is wrong in the country where the wisdom of journalists who don't like to serve in state-owned media and the um, wisdom of voters who don't like taxpayers' money spent on outright state propaganda. Why journalists don't like it? Because they have to switch sides every, <laughs> after every change. That's against the ethics, the basic ethos of the profession. And it's the taxpayer issue which... which so in most advanced so-called old democracies, you don't have a law against having government-owned print press. We just don't have it because of the long, so long working of the revolving stage of politics. Um, you know something is wrong in those countries, but I couldn't agree more with Christopher that TV is the name of the game, that traditional media and most particularly broadcasting and most, more particularly TV is still the way by which democracies, typically so many post-dictatorial democracies on many continents are turned into government um, propaganda machineries and therefore make farce out of free elections and make farce out of all kinds of beautiful constitutions. Um, in, in the post-Soviet world, in, the, in many new Latin American countries, unfortunately, um, growingly so in countries like even South Africa or some other countries, uh, TV is strictly and dominantly in the hands of the state or in the hands of the cronies of the state or family members of the government, and um, whether it is um, licensed out, whether it is commercial, whether it is so-called public service or outright state-owned, um, this is the case. You have many shapes and forms of it, but that's the common denominator that you have it in the hand. And most of the electorate is getting their news from the evening news of those channels. 
And let me call attention to the very special new form of it, compared actually to communism, or a slight disagreement with what Christopher said, um, unlike Iran or China, because the rest, Russia or, or uh, some other countries, do have a fragile pluralism in the print press, and they quite have a pluralism in the very developing online press, but not in TV, and people get their news still from TV. Let me call attention to two very special time of mimicries, of disguises. One is parliamentary, and the other is um, com com uh, commercial, uh, most market, let's call it market mimicry. Um, the laws which define that the government can have those influences in that are all parliament passed laws and all pa majority passed laws. And everybody can say, what, what's the trouble with democracy? Your trouble seems to be that this is a majoritarian democracy, that this is the rule of the majority that rules here. So this is one mimicry and the other is, of course, the market mimicry, uh, which, which makes so many countries, uh, typically Putin's uh, uh, exercise, who um, gives the great energy giant of the country a media arm. It's called, it's called media, I mean, Gazprom media, Gazprom media. And then as a quasi-private player on the quasi-private market, it is having uh, the bulk of the broadcast media. So this is the market mimicry, as if they were independent from the state countries. And let me finish by two po Have I one more minute? Um, do I have two points? One is, it, it is exactly about my own country. Um, we had a panel about this, so I mentioned it only very briefly. Um, this tripartite system, so typical of new democracies east of Kiev or in some Latin American countries or in some African countries, where you have state-owned broadcasting or state-influenced broadcasting or state-fed broadcasting or state-intimidated broadcasting, so many shapes and forms, is the bulk of the information system, then you have a dying print press with some fragile uh, pluralism, which is the characteristic of, it's called, we call it new democracy, we call it democracy because of that, because in Iran, in China, or in the communism, it didn't have that. And finally, you have online and developing, and, and if, it, if it's not brutally oppressed with a, fan, with a fantastic input of money and power, like in Iran and China, then it's quite plural. And um, it's a struggling scene. That's what watchdogs all over the world fight today against the new intimidations of the online, but still is. And, um, and uh, the, the other issue I would like to say that many post-democratic countries came out of this illiberal, um, dominated media type of scene. Most famous was um, Ukraine, uh, Georgia at its, at its color revolution, and some other countries. My observation as a watchdog was no country could came, come out un, from under the illiberal stage of post-dictatorial democracy if not having one independent broadcasting channel. Without that, it's hopeless. It's hopeless. It was B92 in, in Serbia, which was the first color revolution. It was Rustavi 2 in Ukraine. It was Channel 5. Uh, sorry, it was Channel 5 in Ukraine and it was Rustavi 2 in Georgia. And, um, and without that, it's just hopeless. So, what Christopher already mentioned, the edge of the fight is against not just simply civil society, but civil society owned media and the coupling of the two. Not by chance, um, Putin's um, regime, media regime, I mean, was the pioneering in coupling the anti-civil society and the anti-media laws, making out of them a kind of letter seen to belong to each other <laughs> and, 
uh, reason for, su for suspen suspension or obliteration. So I would, I would finish here and, and just would mention the sorrow that in my country you have this three-party system um, without the brutality, without the violence, of course, which is accompany accompanying so many uh, such illiberal systems, which is very good news. But um, the very first such media system based on total domination of the broadcast in, inside the European Union, and it's better for Europeans if the European Union finds tools to fight that plague. Thank you very much, uh, Miklos. I, I would um, emphasize this point that in the Russian case, and I didn't mention it at the outset, uh, Gazprom Media owns a wide range of cable stations. It owns newspapers. Uh, it's a whole media conglomerate that allows the authorities to keep a hand beyond even the um, uh, officially recognized state media in the country. And this issue of um, countries that are young democracies adopting some of the approaches and techniques for mass media um, suppression is perhaps one of the most worrying developments looking at some of the things that have been the standard uh, to the east of where we are here today and now perhaps seeping their way um, westward in some respects, but perhaps we can come back to that. So I'd like to ask uh, Yuri to share some thoughts um, uh, on developments in Ukraine, if he would. Thank you very much. Dobry den, hello. Uh, since the year of 2010, Ukraine uh, is ruled uh, by a very, uh, very special group, uh, which in, in comparison to its predecessors strives uh, to the highest extent for a total control. For the time being, they didn't manage to establish some real dictatorship, but uh, dictatorial tendencies are evident. Of course, the control upon the media is in the very center of uh, their attention. Are we saw striving changes on our TV already in the first months of their rule. The closure of a number of TV programs uh, with the uh, very funny reason uh, they were not uh, enough professional. Or uh, replacement of uh, objective information about, uh, about uh, this new administration uh, in TV news uh, to completely positive information, just uh, propaganda of success, so to speak, and uh, the less success, the more propaganda. Uh, or maybe endless, endless uh, entertainment shows uh, which, in my opinion, are the latent form of the same success propaganda. Uh, you probably know the word uh, Maidan, which is the name of, uh, of the main square in Ukrainian capital, uh, Kiev, the uh, independence square, Maidan Nezaleznosti. So it was the, the very central arena of uh, our Orange Revolution uh, uh, of 2004. And uh, for today's regime, uh, each remembrance, each motif uh, connected to this event, to the Orange Revolution, is highly, um, highly uh, 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 sharp and uh, uh, and unnice and uh, uh, drastic. And uh, the managers of uh, one of the, of the most uh, popular and uh, most uh, influential TV channels invited uh, some program. Uh, they bring 
the masses of, of the youth from different cities and regions uh, to Kiev. And they organize the, uh, their uh, big dance show for the young people, uh, maybe thousands of them. Uh, this is a kind of contest, of, of dance competition between the regions, between the cities. And the name of this uh, very popular show is My Dance. Uh, so it is a, a, an attempt uh, to uh, somehow to, to replace this uh, legend of Orange Revolution uh, by some uh, other entertainment uh, uh, approach. Uh, one personal digression. Uh, I have already forgotten when I was watching Ukrainian TV for the last time. Apparently, it was the football match uh, Ukraine versus Montenegro. And uh, I switched it out after the first half, anyway. But uh, formerly, a majority of main TV channels is uh, private. I mean, owned by, by the oligarchs. Or maybe they are partly fictitious representatives. Only the first national remains a state channel, an official state TV channel. But the uh, specificity uh, of Ukrainian oligarchy consists uh, nowadays in the fact that uh, it is getting more and more dependent from one ruling person and uh, from its uh, family. So uh, we don't have, as it was in Russia 10 years ago, uh, we don't have good and bad oligarchs. Uh, they all were forced to become good in our country. I mean, loyal to the president and his family as it has happened uh, in Russia later. If someone of them would rebel, his uh, chances to come off unhurt would practically on zero. Russia is for Mr. Yanukovych, for our president, uh, on, the one, uh, on the one hand uh, a model a good pattern, worthy of following. On the other, his maneuver can't be so huge and uh, so comfortable as the maneuver of uh, Russian president. However, some critical programs have survived on practically all Ukrainian TV channels. Although their authors and teams are constantly facing more and more problems of realization, more and more often exposing to conflicts and balancing on the edge of, of closure. The very existence of uh, such critical episodes on the TV uh, is a rather uh, odds and ends of previous more liberal times, which uh, the present regime couldn't annihilate by no at one moment. The only totally independent and purely critical to the state uh, to the state power channel is nowadays uh, the channel uh, called TVI with a small letter I at the end. And as a result uh, of this position they take, 
uh, they function in a total stress, stress, endless, and uh, all the time uh, on the edge of surviving because uh, of the constant uh, tax rates and problems with disabling in, in different cities and regions, uh, mostly uh, on the geographical east and south of the country. The audience of uh, TVI, of this channel, is, uh, uh, often relocates uh, itself to, uh, to the internet because this is a channel which provides uh, simultaneous internet broadcasting. So uh, the people who are following uh, the programs of TVI, they have this possibility uh, to get them, uh, even if the programs are disabled in their city, but they have to be internet users. Internet community is actually the most critical segment of society. Internet media became more powerful than uh, the printed media, the press, and they make a strong competition uh, to a television. Uh, there is a phenomenon of uh, influence. Uh, this is the, the internet portal called Ukrainska Pravda. Uh, it was grounded by legendary Georgi Gongadze uh, 12 years ago. And uh, this is uh, completely independent of uh, any uh, state power influence uh, media. Uh, they have the hundreds of thousands of maybe, if not, if not millions of uh, readers. And uh, the state power uh, begins to realize, to understand that actually uh, this uh, rapid development of internet using in our country can be dangerous uh, for the nearest future of regime and they try to influence the internet too. So we have a very interesting uh, uh, event, very interesting situation with the, uh, the experience, uh, the, the flowering actually, the, the, flower, the flowering of uh, internet trolling. As Wikipedia says in internet slang, the word troll is someone who posts inflammatory, extraneous or off-topic messages with the primary intent of provoking readers into an, an emotional response and destroying normal on-topic discussion. In Ukraine, there are the lots of trolls who are doing it, so to speak, servingly, uh, invited by, by the state structures, and uh, they, they are paid for that. So uh, it became a kind of, of profession to be a troll. Uh, and the groups of the trolls uh, are called crews, or in, um, in Ukrainian, Brehade. Overall, this is uh, very similar to Russia, to a lesser extent to Belarus, although uh, some analysts tend to compare uh, Ukraine today with Belarus, let's say, uh, 15 years ago. I mean, uh, the earlier period of uh, Lukashenko. Uh, the uniqueness uh, lies in the fact that from all three countries of this uh, Eastern Slavic triangle of post-Soviet uh, authoritarian uh, regimes, uh, from, uh, from all three uh, 
neighbor countries, uh, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. Ukraine is the only one which uh, declared, at least, it's striving to join Europe, to be a member of European Union, and uh, by now it wasn't cancelled. It wasn't cancelled yet by uh, of some official declaration of our government. And this makes some troubles for Ukrainian regime, uh, which still has to imitate some tolerance towards, uh, let's say, disobedient media. For example, with all their wish, they still have not closed the channel TVI. And the result of, of uh, the parliamentary elections uh, on next Sunday uh, will probably determine uh, the future behavior of our regime, uh, which kind of behavior uh, they take. Thank you. Thank you very much for that terrific dissection of Ukraine's media. You mentioned uh, internet trolling in Ukraine, and I think what we've seen in the last several years are some limited instances of this uh, phenomenon, um, and it's spread quite vastly now. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, in China, you have the 50 Cent Party, which is the uh, companion to the brigades that Yuri described in Ukraine and Belarus, um, and Russia has something very similar to this as well. In essence, uh, people either working directly for uh, state authorities or working as um, surrogates, outsourced, who receive some sort of uh, modest compensation for making posts that either confuse or otherwise distort um, legitimate online discussion on certain issues. So the, uh, the state hand in these settings is moving um, from offline to online as a way to uh, define the debate and manage some element of control. I think the other very important point to keep in mind is that in all of these settings, including Ukraine with TVI being an example, the authorities don't necessarily seek to control everything. They seek to control what matters most to them. So there's quite a bit of space left for uh, quite a wide variety of discussion in virtually all the settings we're discussing. But when it comes to um, important issues or issues that would enable uh, real collective action by virtue of media communication, that's usually where the um, um, line is drawn by these regimes. And perhaps that's a good segue to uh, Professor uh, Hu, who will share uh, his observations on China with us. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to be invited to this very interesting uh, panel. And uh, its topic is about uh, state-dominant media and its challenge to democracy. So China is uh, very unique, I should say. Uh, we are at the uh, very end of the spectrum. Uh, that I mean nearly all media in China are state-owned and state-dominated. And on the other hand, uh, we should say we are not a democracy yet. We, we are kind of like an authoritarian uh, <clears throat> political system. So that puts China into a you, you know a kind of very unique position in in this whole uh, discussion. So I I think uh, most of you uh, may not be know clearly about uh, China's uh, media system, uh, but it's highly related to uh, uh, China's uh, uh, political uh, status uh, because China is still a one-party uh, state. So the, the party maintains tight controls on political uh, expression, on you know, uh, collective uh, action, on assembly, and uh, religion, and whatever. <coughs> so uh, 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 everybody knows that China uh, has seen uh, you know, a strong economic rise in recent years. 
but political reform actually lags behind the rapid development of the economy. Uh, <clears throat> so this kind of uh, development uh, leaves a, a very heavy uh, mark on the on media development. Uh, what I call is a permanent theme between, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a struggle between uh, two P's. Uh, that means it's one is profit, the other is propaganda. You can always always say the theme in, in, in the Chinese media scene. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, on the other hand, uh, we can say China has a unique media system that can be defined as sole ownership, uh, but binary operation. Uh, by sole ownership, I mean that the party state owns all major media companies, including newspapers, magazines, uh, TV stations, radio stations. Uh, uh, but internet is a different story. I, I may come to, to, to this later on. Uh, <clears throat> So the, uh, the internet networks actually is owned by the state, but there are a lot of uh, you know, service providers. There are public companies uh, in NASDAQ, in New York uh, Stock Exchange, so it's a different story. Uh, uh, but all the traditional media are, uh, are totally owned by the party state. So through this ownership, the state has tremendous power over the media market. Uh, by binary op operation, I mean that while the media take, take advantage of their state ownership to enhance their profit because they're supported by the state. Uh, and on the other hand, that profit is also used to fulfill ideological goals. <clears throat> so uh, we also see uh, a big change in the, in the Chinese media in the past 20 years is called commercialization. <clears throat> So uh, since the economic reforms, the party and the state has suspended financial support, you know, to, uh, uh, except uh, some very big uh, media companies, all the local ones and a lot of, you know, uh, weak ones are, are, are left to the market. Uh, so commercialization means that the media have undergone a two-fold process of transformation. Uh, first, uh, changing from being a state propaganda vehicle uh, to only to, uh, uh, to also serving the interests of the audience. So now they are catering the market. Uh, <clears throat> and second, uh, changing from a state-owned media institution to a state capitalist entity, uh, but what we call with socialist characteristics. So the post-1990s period has seen a majority of news media become financially independent from the government. So uh, in this sense, commercialization actually means that media enjoy a certain kind of, uh, you know, editorial freedom. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but uh, uh, those media also remain an integral part of the functioning of the government. And also, they adhere to the uh, party's uh, propaganda line. So uh, it's uh, it's a very, uh, uh, you know, you have old and new, it's a, it's a mixed picture. And now uh, the internet part, uh, because the, 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 the Chinese internet is mostly developed by, you know, the, uh, by people who are young and educated in American universities like Stanford or whatever. Then they, they, they saw the chance and they, they think they, the market will explode. Then they, so look, they, they went back to China. Then they found up, you know, the biggest uh, we call it news portals in China, also the biggest search engines, even defeat Google in uh, in Chinese market, and also you know the social media and electronic commerce. Those are all you know uh, actually controlled by the new generation of. Uh, entrepreneurs uh, and supported by venture capitalists. So that means the structure of the internet industry is totally different from the uh, traditional Chinese media industry. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's a very uh, uh, phenomenal uh, development. So we can say new space and also the uh, new horizon uh, 
brought up by this uh, new structure of the internet uh, industry, and we also we can see a vibrant. I, I really think it's very vibrant uh, civil society. You know, in 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 uh, is is uh, in in its budding uh, process of uh, grow into a full uh, fledging uh, uh, you know uh, force to. To to function in the great transformation of the Chinese society, uh, so that's a very brief introduction. And uh, uh, if you have m more questions, maybe we will come to them later on. Thank you very much for that uh, description of the Chinese media scene. I know the um, the scope of the country and the, the rapidity of the internet growth there makes for a very interesting um, sphere of study. Perhaps I'll start with a question uh, relating to um, the relationship between new and old media in China because clearly the um, hundreds of millions of users of the internet and microbloggers in China, even with the um, limitations they may face in terms of some degree of uh, keyword censorship or other forms of censorship that's applied in China today must be having some sort of influence on uh, state media editorial decisions. So I'd be curious to know uh, what you see as perhaps the main dynamic or influence between the space that's being uh, pushed for by users of the internet and the state media which has a different um, uh, editorial structure based on the um, uh, ongoing ownership and control of the authorities. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, big question. Uh, uh, in China, uh, now we, the, you know, the most uh, m most uh, popular, uh, most popular application right now is called Weibo. Uh, it's a kind of Twitter style uh, microblogging, and you can say nearly every news organization, I mean every major news organization, they open their Weibo accounts and there are a lot of uh, uh, journalists and editors who are highly active in, in, in that space. But to come to the question of, of Chris, uh, uh, just uh, this year, uh, the, you know, the, the party organ, uh, the People's Daily actually opened its Weibo account and uh, and actually, I think it's quite successful. Uh, it's uh, nearly, uh, I mean, in a month, it's actually accumulated uh, 100 million, uh, 1 million uh, followers. So, uh, so the you know the you know the the head of People's Daily actually gets very exciting about it, and and he said we may reinvent People's Daily on the you know Chinese cyberspace. So that shows uh, uh, they think originally this this Weibo is uh, totally dominated by by you know by the so-called uh, opinion leaders and netizens, which are highly critical of the Chinese government. And now they think it's it's, it's their turn to try to grab you know that uh, friend back into their hands. So you, c you can see this very interesting development and, uh, and also it shows uh, the, uh, uh, the netizen power actually have tremendous uh, influence upon the traditional party media. So they have a motive and they have, you know, uh, uh, motivation to change themselves to, 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 to adapt you know, to this new media environment. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'll just mention before I ask uh, Yuri a question, uh, someone recommended to me a wonderful paper that's just been released in the last couple of weeks by uh, several scholars. The lead scholar on the paper is a professor by the name of Gary King, and they've done a very elaborate analysis of the um, underlying basis for uh, censorship strategy of the Internet in China. And one of the things they argue in the paper, which I think is fascinating as a, as a window into the um, logic of modern censorship is that the authorities in China, it appears from this analysis, which looked at millions of pieces of data across the internet um, over a period of time, determined that 
Uh, the authorities aren't really so concerned with criticism of the government. And in fact, there is quite a lot of criticism of the Chinese government on the internet today. What they're very concerned about and what the um, many thousands of censors who are engaged in internet censorship in China focus on most specifically are things that lend themselves to collective action. So any sort of communication on a subject that suggests people are starting to communicate and organize, that's what's uh, sanitized and cleansed from the internet, not only um, most thoroughly, but most quickly. So there's some wonderful graphs that the uh, scholars have provided that shows the amount of censorship that occurs within 24 hours of a certain topic uh, be becoming discussed on the internet. Um, very quick, it's the first 24 hours where any mentions are uh, removed and after that it slows down. The idea being um, trying to uh, essentially preempt meaningful organization or collective action. So I think this is also another dimension of the uh, new media landscape where um, politically unfree governments are moving very quickly to find ways to not uh, censor everything but to focus on what they believe is most important. I have a question for uh, Yuri. One of the things that became apparent in the late uh, 1980s leading up to 1991 was uh, a real desire by journalists in the former Soviet Union to have a chance to express themselves. And as Mikhail Gorbachev uh, opened up Glasnost in the former Soviet Union, you could actually see journalists start to agitate for more space and look to fill that role. What it suggested was um, there was both, there was a demand uh, on the part of journalists in those settings to do those things. And it reminded me in uh, 2002, 2003, and then leading up to the Orange Revolution in the fall of 2004, it was very similar. Journalists were eager to be able to apply their skills and their interests. It was only after the political breakthrough that they were able to do that. Temniki were removed. Um, these were the theme directives that the authorities uh, imposed on journalists in Ukraine at the time. Um, I'd be curious for your thoughts now, if you would uh, give a sense of the degree of resilience of the Ukrainian media in the face of this political pressure, and in essence the state using its instruments to um, push down the space that was created from the end of 2004 essentially to the end of 2009, um, in advance of Mr. Yanukovych's return to power, if you could somehow characterize that um, at this stage. Um, yes, there is actually the, the figure, figure uh, the, the person, personality of, uh, I mentioned before, uh, who uh, stays on, on the very beginning of uh, our revolution of 2004. I mean, Georgi Gongadze, uh, the founder, founder of uh, this above-mentioned uh, internet portal Ukrainska Pravda, uh, and uh, he was an independent Ukrainian journalist with uh, Georgian uh, roots. Uh, he lived uh, in Kiev, and uh, so in the year uh, 2000, he founded this internet portal, which is incredibly influential now nowadays. And uh, it is a, a really a very special success story uh, how to do uh, the best independent, very objective, uh, mass media in internet, but he disappeared in the year 2000. He was kidnapped uh, by authorities. Actually, his case is not cleared uh, by now. Uh, uh, it is clear he was annihilated by the system, uh, but it wasn't uh, cleared in uh, some uh, process, uh, juridical process in a court. Uh, so, uh, I think the role of journalism in Ukraine uh, is uh, 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 very high uh, in, in that uh, personal, uh, after this personal case of Georgi Gongadze and uh, the 
behavior, the, the uh, social and uh, civic uh, courage of uh, and activity of uh, Ukrainian journalists was somehow uh, 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 s somehow inspired by him, by his uh, example. Uh, after this uh, more or less liberal time between uh, 2005 and 2010, the journalists in Ukraine uh, became, uh, became, of course, uh, uh, more uh, influential and uh, more powerful, and they are able uh, to resist. Uh, the, they are organized in a, a different uh, civic committees like uh, anti-censorship committee of journalists. Uh, they organize uh, their protests uh, very effective. And uh, so the, the newest, uh, the newest victory of uh, Ukrainian journalists uh, upon authorities was this uh, cancellation of some uh, uh, project with the law about uh, I don't know the English word about uh, injury uh, of uh, official persons. Defamation, of, oh, of course, defamation of uh, official persons. So it was, uh, it was cancelled. I'm not sure it was cancelled uh, forever, but it was a very good example how uh, the journalists, uh, so the, 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 the active parts of society uh, can uh, resist. I should just make clear, I don't think Yuri mentioned it, certainly for the uh, younger people in the audience. Uh, Georgi Gangadze, when he was found, he was found with his head cut off, uh, and the strong suspicion is that uh, this was as a result of his reporting. Um, uh, Miklos uh, Harasti, you've had the unusual experience of uh, observing and traveling to many of these countries that have had uh, politically closed or partially closed environments and seeing their media systems. Um, Going back seven or eight years ago, it might have been um, incredible to imagine that uh, countries in the Visegrad region could come under some of these pressures whereby um, media constraints could be reapplied on mass media. Uh, this is perhaps one of the most important uh, achievements of the pro political breakthroughs uh, from 21 years ago and 23 years ago. Uh, where we're sitting now. And in some ways, if you look at uh, North Africa and the Middle East, one of the most important early breakthroughs, and some of the final resolution isn't quite clear, in Tunisia, which was one of the most, not only politically repressive countries in the world, but had one of the most repressive media environments before the uh, breakthroughs and the removal of President Ben Ali a year and a half ago. Uh, they've actually opened a lot of media space there, which is quite an achievement. In Egypt, it's a little more ambiguous, but still has some promise. But I guess my question to you would be, um, having observed so many of these settings, knowing the um, byproducts and the challenges that arise from state media dominance, what um, sorts of warnings or observations might you share for countries that are um, more in the category of young democracies, perhaps not fully consolidated to um, both perhaps for outsiders and people within the borders of those countries, what sort of um, observations might you share on how to avoid um, more negative outcomes? And I'm thinking, of course, of, of Hungary, which is in the process of a um, set of measures which many view as inhospitable to um, media freedom. Um, such a media system is always just tip of the iceberg. It never comes alone um, in itself. Um, Hungary, is, which, as I mentioned, uh, thanks God, is not sharing these countries in level of violence, although those illiberal features seem to have led inevitably to the kind of violence and and. Um, accompanying government impunity 
that is so typical of some of these countries. But, um, but what is shared and which Hungary is a good, how to say, a good, a good case study of is how it goes together with limitations of other good, good things of democracy. Most importantly, independence of judiciary, most importantly, checks and balances like division of branches of power, the existence or annihilation of independence of institutions that are designed uh, originally for maintaining um, all kinds of minority rights, actually freedom of speech being the most important minority right on earth. And, uh, and um, this go goes together. If a media entrepreneur, a media owner, especially actually even foreign media owners in Hungary, uh, who would not dare and would not stand in their own country this type of licensing or license revocation kind of power of the media board. They, to start with the actual political composition of the media board, they would not stand in their own country a uniparty, uh, solely ruling party composed media board, which is, which is commonplace in, in, in Russia or, or anywhere else, um, they give up in Hungary. Why? Because if they have investment in other territories or just in other parts of the media, then everywhere in public life of Hungary, they now stumble into um, institutions, municipalities, ministries, which have the final say without any checks and balances. Without, because of clever appointments which uh, had these independent institutions and whole branches of power with practically lifetime appointment, 999 years. <laughs> this is the famous system of Hungary. So this is very important. Um, other checks and balances are also very, that's one lesson. The other lesson is I was amazed and, and thrilled by what Yuri said that once you had the color revolution which is a shorthand for uh, taking illiberal democracies uh, back on path and making them less illiberal. Most importantly, establishing uh, pluralism in the media. That pluralism, that's the final most important flower of media freedom, and I would dare to say even the actual goal of media freedom, to establish pluralism, because only a plural, quite demonopolized but quite strong media core can maintain their own freedoms. Nobody else can. And I was so glad to hear that this is still the case. Um, in, in Hungary, there was practically no opposition to the fact that um, a lot of uh, protected speech, which had been protected until the new media law, in Hungary was passed inside the media law without any opposition from the, from the press corps, uh, neither from the European Union, by the way. <laughs> and um, and uh, so this is very important. Maintain pluralism. Pluralism is the most important thing. Never allow the government to trample on pluralism. Can I have one word about the online thing? Because it was so interesting what, what was also said. Um, we are in a transitory period. The Chinese account of affairs was fascinating because in a very cautiously optimistic tone, uh, the gentleman said, um, this is something budding, this is something a new period, it's still something civil society in making, something like this, he said. Um, we are in a historically transitory period, of world history, I would dare to say, waiting for penetration and waiting for bandwidth. From the inception of internet, which is hardly 10 years, I would say, in a, in a kind of practical terms, probably not more than more 10 years to go, and we will have a penetration of online in most countries, at least in, at least in countries which are 
both based on market economy and on civil society pressure, which is both in terms of penetration and in terms of bandwidth are comparable to TV. And then a totally new history starts. So we are all in a kind of transition, uh, waiting, waiting, waiting for that. That uh, countries who would like to bomb back into the uh, Gutenberg Stone Age, or at least into the territorial control of content of media, countries by organized brihada, yeah, t trolls, uh, mm -hmm. and by by all kind of filtering, blocking, by by stopping ISPs to be plural. It's so important. Here is a third, a third absolutely important lesson. Treat ISP pluralism, internet service provider pluralism, as an as important thing as broadcasting pluralism. Because that's the, that's the issue. If you have, if the government has a hand on the one sole central internet service provider of the country, or has a say who can have internet service, who cannot have, then the issue is delayed. This big revolution I'm talking about is delayed then. But while we are, we are waiting for that, these desperate attempts to bomb it, to carve out of the global medium, the finally, uh, finally existent world medium, again, territorially controlled content empires, as they call it, Rusnet and Kaznet, and, and, and all kinds of uh, our own net. I don't know whether China has such a, such a that's, the, uh, that's the legislative effort now. That's the undercover effort, like the Brihada. Actually, not a very new thing. Do you remember Temniki? Yeah. <laughs> Temniki was a, an online-based system of the government at the time when Gungadze still was alive in the, in the Kuchma regime, which, which the color revolution um, finished with, um, they sent a secret passworded online messages to the executors of the government line at the nominally independent news media. That was the Temniki system. So and <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a word play because uh, it fits to the word tema, topic, but other side, Temni is dark. Was, mm. So my point is, uh, care about internet service provider pluralism and endure 10 more years <laughs> and then a totally new world starts because if the infinite, infinite multiplicity of channels that will be available on an absolute bandwidth with an absolute penetration, territorial control of content will be over. I should say, thank you very much, Miklos. Uh, I should say that um, whenever we start a discussion about television today, it always ends up with a discussion on the internet. It's inevitable. Um, and I, I <laughs> just one more, joining you, actually, you also said very wisely that we are also waiting. Here is a third element we are waiting for. Responsible um, quality public journalism online. Now, this is something which will never be total, just like you have in print press and you have in television trash. It comes with freedom. You say the same way you will always have trash online, but at least the possibility of a kind of club of self-inflicting public quality, a kind of uh, self-regulation and self-labeling for public policy would be decisive I don't mind whether behind paywall or for free, that the business model is very important, but it's not our concern right now. The point is, without that, without having a conscious media for democracy, in service of democracy, uh, online, of course, this is also something we, ha we have to wait for. And Thank you for that. I should say, just before we open the floor to questions, I'll... I'll um, uh, encourage you to have a look at something my former colleagues at Freedom House produced. It's a wonderful project called Freedom on the Net, and it's a systematic look at internet freedom in about 50 countries. It's extremely well done. Uh, one of the things I would note, and this is maybe as a cautionary note to Miklos's uh, optimism looking down the road, is that 
in the most recent findings that were released just about a month ago in the Freedom on the Net report, they did some analysis that looked at the countries that had the fastest growing rates of access and use of the Internet and showed the correlations in a number of instances to levels of Internet freedom. And there are a number of countries that are, I think, at least for, for now, defying some of the assumptions, this idea that once the Internet access and speed is open, that um, political pluralism will be inevitable. So countries like China, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Russia, all of whom are now crossing the threshold to 30 percent, 40 percent, in some cases 50 percent of access and use, are also scoring at the worst levels of freedom overall in this analysis. So it's not to say it'll stay that way over time. And there are examples of countries that are growing their access and their use that are also safeguarding online user rights, content uh, integrity, and infrastructure. But um, it's not guaranteed. So I think unless we stay vigilant on that count, um, nothing should be taken for granted. So with that, I'd love to uh, take questions from the audience. I only ask that people um, introduce themselves as they ask the question. We have a question right here. And we have a microphone, if you can wait for just one minute. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Androkovich. I'm uh, Nadia Ivanova. I'm a student from Prague, but I'm the citizen of Ukraine. So I have somewhat internal question. For the last couple of months, we saw um, a lot of actions from the civic society in support of journalists. We saw mass protests in support of TVI. We saw mass protests and internet uh, campaigns against the defamation law, etc. And now the campaign against the law against so-called propaganda of homosexuality and, and etc. Um, how? How do you think it will last uh, after the upcoming election, this cooperation between the civic society and journalists? Because for now, as, as, I, as I see it, journalists are somewhat the leaders of our civic society. How do you see this cooperation after the upcoming elections? And how do you see the influence of this cooperation on the results of these elections? Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm, I'm sure. I'm sure uh, it will be just increasing uh, the cooperation between uh, civic society and, and journalists. Actually, I don't, I, don't, I don't see a contradiction there. Actually, the journalists are the part of, of civic society. Um, and uh, it will be increasing from the very uh, the uh, reason of of the next elections because the parliamentary elections we have uh, next Sunday are to the high extent just uh, a kind of repetition a uh, kind of attempt how the presidential elections in the year 2015 uh, finish and uh, so this is, uh, of course, it will be the very interesting time in Ukraine after uh, these parliamentary elections and till the presidential elections. And uh, so I'm quite optimistic, uh, which uh, concerns uh, this uh, intensiveness of, uh, of uh, and activity of uh, civic society in this country. Uh, I would say uh, it is awakened by this uh, campaign and uh, it will be increasing. Other questions? Why don't we take one here and then there? We can start over here. Thank you. My name is Andrea Tfelova and I am a member of the European Board of Young European Federalists. And this year in February we try to support the young people in Hungary as well with our Hungary action, where it appeared a problem with the press. And what happened also in the sections of Czech Hungary, we had the people 
were not really in favor that the European level wanted to help them somehow. And then there raised me a question whether the CE region and the medias we have in the CE region are interlinked with the EU media press or whether there are very big differences between the EU media approach and the CE medias that are in practice, mostly the blogs and the newspapers whether there are any differences or approach or the messages that are brought on the scene and that the public is demanding in our countries. I'm also from Slovakia, so I'm living in this region. Or whether they are the very different, and that's why the reactions are also different. Um, Central European versus Western European. I'm glad to hear this in the, in the city where President Klaus once declared that it doesn't belong to Central Europe, it, doesn't, it belongs to Western Europe. <laughs> but, um, well, um, I'm not Huntingtonian. I hope it doesn't sound Huntingtonian. If I am saying that the, the common past does mean something. And by the common past, I mean no national, ethnic, uh, whatever, not even history actually, just the immediate dictatorial past, that's what I mean. The fact that, um, that um, generations, especially post-Stalinist type of dictatorial past, even if the Hussak regime was much more cruel than the Kada regime and uh, the Polish regime was in and out cruel and, 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 and wishy-washy, Nevertheless, um, the uh, issue was that generations have accustomed to guided media, to guided opinion, and to fear from authorities in terms of just civil courage to, to express themselves through the school system, not through direct bloody terror, but through the school system. A double, a double tool helped this um, more mild type of communist dictatorships. A double tool, one was the closing of the horizon. That was thanks to the Yalta system, <laughs> not, not, not to their own might. It was not even the Soviets alone, it was the whole world system at the time. Plus the school system, the indoctrination system, uh, which allowed them to pull their kulaki into the karman <laughs> to, to, to have the, have the feasts in their pockets and not, not open on the, on, the, on the desk. So my point is, um, my most scientific uh, definition of post-communism is when the last person who lived under communism dies. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, until then we will have governments who from time to time will have the habit of just not, not wanting to let the total media power th which they remember, if not them, then somebody had <laughs> still in their lifetimes. The peaceful revolving of stage of politics is needed several, several times until all three players the audiences, the journalists, media owners, etc., and politicians understand that uh, the common denominator of damage control is letting the media be pluralistic. But the crucial, the active element is journalists. So that 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 has been the that has been the crushing element with 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 Havel. And, 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 and his people who were in fact, some is the journalists, but they were journalists. That was the situation in Poland, where independent journalism was the strongest. That was the situation with Arting. And I even understand China with its, with its online journalism a little bit like that. And that's the crucial thing. Um, the dynamic uh, point of attack, uh, point of, in, in, in this game. So that was not, a, too much of a consolation because what I, <laughs> the gist of what I said was time, please wait. No, be active and, and, and keep the powder dry. Okay. 
Okay, uh, my name is uh, Alamayo Kumsa. I'm living in uh, Prague, but originally I am from Ethiopia. Uh, if I am not uh, mistaken, this uh, program is uh, the persistence influence of the state-dominated media and uh, the challenge of democracy. If it is, I think you skipped uh, one continent uh, where the worst human being were dominated by uh, political elites or political power holders. Uh, in Ethiopia, there is only one state television, three radio stations, one the state uh, radio station, the second the ruling party radio station, the third one individual from the government. And in Ethiopia, we are 93 million people. You can check from uh, fact books. Uh, let me tell you one, uh, inform you what the two Swedish journalists did in the what happened to them, not only Ethiopians. The worst human rights violation in Ethiopia is in Ogaden, in east, uh, south eastern part of Ethiopia, where Somalis are living. And uh, uh, from 2007, journalists, anybody from foreign country, were forbidden to go to that area. So uh, there are many massacres, uh, many villages were burned down. NASA uh, took a photograph of that area and uh, you can check from Human Rights Watch uh, publish, uh, published materials. And uh, these two human beings, the fighter for humanity, entered the garden through Somalia. And uh, the agent of the government captured them kept uh, them in secret, and uh, after that, they, after three days, they uh, did a film, false film, and uh, they showed in mass media in uh, Ethiopia, and uh, they jailed them for 11 years. After uh, 18 months, the, go uh, the Swedish government coordinated, and uh, they get so-called amnesty. Now you can read what happened to them from BBC and from Swedish mass media, and they are now writing a book to publish. So please, when you discuss about human rights, all of us are genetically the same. We are living in the same time. Try to diverge your views, not only Cuba, Burma, uh, Ukraine, and uh, Belarus, Africa, Africans are struggling for their democratic right. So please include Africa also. Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, and I, I should say the example the gentleman gives in Ethiopia is a very good one in that uh, today the um, opportunities for independent information into that country are so limited that they're relegated to, for example, special satellite television initiatives, uh, precisely because it's, a, it's virtually impossible to reach mass audiences in that country today. Um, and I would, I would also suggest to Miklos's point that the um, example of the Swedish journalists that the gentleman described is also an indication of the control of the judiciary under the Meles government until recently, and now we'll see what um, proceeds after that, but it's a very good example. I think we have time for one or two more questions. We can take them together before we finish if there are more than the one I see here. So why don't we start with the woman in the back, please? Good afternoon. I am a student from the country of Georgia. And uh, I am to some degree surprised that uh, the case of our past elections is not uh, um, a topic of the discussion mostly, because what we witnessed uh, only three weeks ago is uh, really unprecedented. The um, three media channels existing in the country were all governed and controlled by the state uh, authorities, uh, but still the country could witness 
democratic elections. Uh, with the line of the theme of this forum, we really felt the power of powerless. In our case, uh, of not, when not having a chance to be represented on media, we still uh, feel that we succeeded. Uh, but my question concerns more uh, the post-election context. Uh, one of the media channels of those three was already uh, like uh, liquidated, I would say so. Uh, the broadcasting, uh, news broadcasting stopped. The other is uh, public broadcast, uh, so the policy will change, we believe. And the third, the Rustaviori, remains Rustaviori, but do you think uh, in such a fragile democracy as ours, um, through Staviori can, uh, can stay there because the country ca has never had uh, balanced media and if it had ever, it led to revolution. It means that if this government will let the Staviori stay there, they will be afraid of the revolution hitting, I don't know. So how do you think, uh, what's your opinion in the pr prospect, can Staviori stay there or will the new government be willing to shut it down as well? That's my question. I, I think uh, Miklos is probably best suited to answer this. I would say, however, any discussion of Georgian media and politics would deserve an entire session for itself. So <laughs> I'll ask uh, Miklos just to give a brief answer, and then we'll try to have everyone uh, out of here on time. Um, yeah, um, I mean, uh, Georgia is the most political country on earth. It, is, it, it has um, such a fierce civic feeling in all corners that um, it would be enough for, uh, for um, uh, many other countries. My point is that um, uh, as, as, a, as a foreign observer and an, and a, and an observer who, who has not been in the country for quite a while now, a couple of years, um, I, I, ca I cannot give a detailed uh, reply to you, not even you have actually named all those TV stations you are having in mind. Um, but generally speaking, please allow me to slightly disagree with you. I believe that the last Georgian elections uh, fortify my, it is my example of without independent TV channels, there are there is no such a thing as a liberal revolving stage of politics as it should be. The last election was nothing. Please, this is a very far-fetched point, especially for somebody who has come um, in a Georgian way to quite, so to say, hate the, the past government, the present president, or whoever. It is a fruit, in a sense, just like in Yuri countries, the resistance and pluralism of the media, which resists the illiberal tendencies in government, the same way, if the Saakashvili government had illiberal tendencies, the way the, the civil society and the media has resisted it is a fruit a little bit of the color revolution that happened under the leadership of Saakashvili, but was in fact the achievement of the Georgian nation. And um, it's the, because of that, it is the second set of free elections since the, uh, since the Rose Revolution, because uh, the first one was which you, with, the, with your occupational demonstration on the squares, hell no, we won't go, we won't leave the squares until we have the new, new set of fresh free elections under good rules, and this is the second. So my point is, I can, I can list, if I sketch my head, I can list several independent TV stations that existed not, you are right, not on the cheap antennas, not on the, on the, on the um, analog, not in the analog uh, distribution system. They were um, cable TVs made national, allowed to be, uh, go on the sky, etc. by, by Saakashvili. It was a fight, I remember that. And Saakashvili was, even if he had tendency, he, he allowed it. He made this terrible thing on 2007 November. 
he pulled the plug of, uh, of the independent t TV channel. Uh, Rustavi II, it was? Imedi, it was, I'm sorry. And, um, and then we went with Adam Michnik, actually, we went um, to the country and visited everybody and ed ended the day in his, in his uh, uh, study. And we told him, you have been our hero, but this is no way. You have to put, you have to put Imedi back. And then he found a modicum to put it back with some, with some resistance, but he had to put it back. Point is, if Georgia's last election is an example of anything, then it is, okay, it is of two things, that liberal democracy works only if you have a pluralism of media and that civic resistance rules. Civic resistance is most important. Well, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to conclude this session in the spirit of thoughtful disagreement, right in the spirit of Forum, uh, Forum 2000. And I'd really like to express my thanks to all three of the panelists, to Hu Young, uh, Yuri Androkovic, and Milos Horazti for their observations. I thought they were just outstanding. And I'd like to thank all of you for your attention and uh, the terrific questions as well. Thank you very much.